recording. Hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we're in the, I was going to say in the midst, but we're not in the middle yet. This is our, our I think, our fourth study in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the Beatitudes, and we're looking at them one at a time. And this week we're looking at Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek. So we're glad you can be here with us to participate in that, be a part of what, what the Lord is doing here. Uh, and before we start, I just want to remind you again, I want to encourage you, not, not to take my word for what I say here, but to test the things that I say here against the word. And then to take what you hear here during this study and meditate on it. Go talk to the Lord about it. Spend time just thinking about it, pondering these things, and hearing from God, because that's what can change you and build faith in your life. So I'm here, and I'm joined, as usual, with, with Mark and Alice. Hello. And you, and we're so blessed that you can be here. So tonight, before we start, I'm going to ask Alice to pray. Because we like to ask God's blessing on what we're going to do here. Yes. Right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we just praise you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And we thank you for his word that is teaching us tonight. The greatest sermon ever preached. And we just ask for your wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding. And to bless all those who partake in this. And to just... Give it out whenever we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, as I said, we're in Matthew chapter 5, and we're in verse 5 this evening. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Before we start, uh, I want to go to the dictionary. And I want to do something. I, I thought about this, and... I really believe this is something important, that we understand this, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to talk about what an oxymoron is. Now, um, if you know what an oxymoron is, I want to give you the dictionary definition, by the way. The dictionary says that it's a, a rhetorical device in which two seemingly contradictory words are used together for effect. Like, she's just a poor little rich girl, mm -hmm. okay? Poor and rich. Can't be both at the same time. You've heard a lot, I'm sure. A, a jumbo shrimp, right? Tragic comedy. Larger half. Pretty ugly. Deafening silence. Those are examples of oxymorons. Because what an oxymoron is, is a contradiction in terms. Okay? The other one I want to talk about, and this is what's really important, is because they're different, is a paradox. Now, paradox, by, by the way, I, I wanted to share this. The word oxymoron comes from two Greek words, oxys, which means sharp, and moros, which means stupid. Mm -hmm. That's where we get the English word moron. It's morons, right. right? So something can't be, you know, it's like sharp, sharp and, and dull or stupid at the same time. That's what an oxymoron, that's where it comes from. A paradox, listen to this, back to the dictionary. A statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses a truth. An opinion or statement contrary to commonly accepted opinion. A seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement that is or may be true. An opinion that conflicts with common belief. This is what a paradox is. Now, the reason it's important to understand this is because the Bible, the Scriptures, the eternal Word of God, which are holy and pure and correct, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22, is a paradox. All right? The reason it's a paradox is because, think about what it's said now, right? Things that are conflict with common belief. The world rejects the Word of God and says it's all wrong. But it's not all wrong. When you try, when you try and deal with people and share the Word of God and they reject it, it's because it's a paradox to them. 
It's a contradiction to what they believe. Now, the word paradox, and you know, I, I just love words because I think words are important. God spoke the world into existence. He spoke everything into existence with a word, right? It comes from para, which means contrary or against, and doxa, opinion. It's not contrary to the truth. It's contrary to people's opinion. All right? We gather in the Word of God, here in every one of these Bible studies, to gain wisdom and understanding. That's what this is about. We need, under, we need understanding of the Word of God, and we need wisdom to apply the Word of God in our lives. If you look in Proverbs, which is so much about wisdom, about knowledge, about understanding, it says, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. That's Proverbs 3.13. Blessed is the man who finds... This sounds like one of the Beatitudes. Yes, it does. That's all about being blessed. You want to be blessed? Well, find wisdom and gain understanding. Um, the Beatitudes, again, I just want to say this. That's just you know a Latin term that came to be applied to this portion of Scripture of Jesus' teaching. And I've heard it called over and over and over, be happy attitudes. I don't think that, it's not about being happy. It's about being blessed, which is different. And if uh, you, do, you missed the first study we did in the Beatitudes, it went into that. Go look at it. It's there online to look at. Here at Bible Talk, we, we use an expression, and you know I don't want to lose people because they're not going to understand what I say. But the expression that we use is purple grass. The world's wisdom and its understanding is purple grass. Now, I, I can tell you this. Um, by the way, purple grass, we do the Bible Bites, the little Bible Bites, and we send them out every week. They're available. They're online on the Bible Talk site. The whole archive, right now, I think we're up to 116 Bible Bites. But one of the Bible Bites is purple grass. So if you can go on there and take a look and find this, the idea was that we've been trained and taught by the world to believe something. And then when you get saved, you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the truth, and you realize that what the world has been telling you is not true. And what Jesus has spoken in the Word, or what the Word says and teaches, is true. Every time something happens, it's still like, you, this is why Paul said we have to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Because your brain still registers what the world, what the taught, world you. taught you. Mm -hmm. Because remember, you started learning from the world from, from the very, very beginning, until the time you were saved. It's really, really important to understand this, because otherwise the Word of God is never going to make sense to you until you understand that your first and your natural reaction is this purple grass. You, you automatically go back to that teaching of the world, all right? Jesus Christ, by the way, think about this now. The world is in the power of the evil one, of Satan. That's what John said, 1 John 5, 19. Now, he is a liar by nature and the father of lies. Jesus said that in John 8, 44. Okay? The wisdom of the world, then, is earthly, natural, and demonic. That's what James says in James 3.15. So, now, in James, which talks about wisdom, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives this to you generously and freely. But the wisdom of the world, that is one wisdom, three adjectives. What the world believes, the, uh, what the world understands about what they see, they look at the same things as you and I, but they don't understand it. And their wisdom is based on their false understanding. The training that you see. It's earthly. It's natural. But the Word of God says it's also demonic. Because the origin of it is Satan, the father of lies. So you now, as a Christian, however long you've been a Christian, you have to start to take the Word of God and contrast it to what the world teaches. Jesus is the ultimate paradox. That's what I say. 
Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's Matthew eleven twenty-eight, right? Jesus, he is the king who came as a servant. That's a paradox. The world can't understand that. He is the Lord who washed his disciples' feet. It's a paradox. He is the one in whom all the fullness of deity dwells. That's what the word says. Yet he emptied himself. He is the master whose name is life, yet he humbled himself in obedience to death, even death on the cross. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat shall fall into the earth and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. You have to die to yourself to find life. That's a paradox. That was John 12, by the way. Uh, years ago, there was a guy named Graham Kendrick in the United Kingdom, and he wrote a song. It's a beautiful song. It's from the mid-80s, I think, called Meekness and Majesty. You ever hear that yes. song? Meekness and Majesty? It, it is a beautiful. And I, I just wanted to read you a couple of lines from uh, the lyrics of that song, and then they can sing it for you. Meekness and Majesty, man Hood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God. Wisdom unsearchable, God the invisible, love indestructible, in frailty appears. Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly, lifts our humanity to the heights of his throne. This is what Jesus said about authority. It's the acts, it is the true authority that comes from the author of all things, God Almighty, is not at all what the world understands. They think it means, and this is what the word says, that means lording it over. That authority means you're bossing somebody around, you're lording over them. But here, what Jesus is teaching, what authority means, is the, to, to serve others. To bless others by serving them. That's exactly what he did. Jesus Christ, this King of kings, this Lord of lords, this King of glory, came, and he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. The Word of God is a paradox. It is in contrast to what the world understands. It's not just, you know, I don't, I don't say this in condemnation of the people who have been blindsided by the devil. But the simple fact of the matter is, most Christians are living their lives by wisdom that comes from the world, by understanding that comes from the world, by knowledge that comes from the world. Well, I want to talk about this word meek now. Because Jesus Christ said, blessed are the meek. It's translated in, in some of the translations as gentle. It's translated some places as humble. I'm going to work with humble, because I, that is what this word means, okay? Um, again, I'll take you back to the dictionary. And I, by the way, when I say the dictionary, I use a number of dictionaries, and that's a tool that I keep right alongside of my Bible when I'm doing these studies, because I, again, I think that it's so important for us to understand the, what the words mean. Meek is an adjective, and it means humbly, patient, or docile, as under provocation from others. Over, this is from the dictionary now. This is not from me, not from the word, all right? Overly submissive or compliant, spiritless or tame, patient, long-suffering or submissive in disposition or nature, humble, spineless or spiritless, compliant. Now that's what the world sees as meek. I don't think if, if these all apply to being meek, you're not going to be blessed by being that. No, spineless. You know, it's it's just that's a that's. Truth mixed with a lie. But I'm um, just thinking about spineless. Is you can't be upright. You would be always bowed down. Well, I'm saying it's, it's truth mixed with a lie. Mm -hmm. Parts of it are true and parts of it are not true. 
It's that's the way I've said. You know, Satan wants to kill you. He wants to poison you. He he comes because he wants to take your life. He wants to steal, to rob, to kill, to destroy. So think about what that what that definition say. Meekness, gentleness, humility mm -hmm. are. If you'd ask a person, they'd be all good traits. Yes, I think, I think yes. people until they would say you read the definition. And what they would say it until it's time to do it. Okay? Be, because they, be those things that you just said, gentle. people would say out of their mouths, mm -hmm. yes, those are good traits. But in fact, the world has trained us to be something other than that. Right. And in reality, we don't think that they're good. Right. And I'll, I'll show you why, yeah, right? That's true. Um, let me just go back to what I was saying. Right? If Satan wants to destroy you, and he wants to kill you, and he gives you a glass of something, he wants to poison you, for example, and that's what he does, is poison. He wants to poison your spirit so it dies. You don't hand a person a glass of poison. You hand a person a glass of something they like. that they like, with just a little bit of poison in it. Right? You can't, that dictionary defin definition, you can't be, it's a overly submissive. You can't no. be, a Christian can't be overly submissive right. to the Lord. And he, the Lord is the authority in your life, right? And either you're submissive or you're not. It's like being pregnant, eh? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, but the submissive that we are supposed to be is totally submissive. Totally. Now, if you are totally submissive, how, you, how, you can't be overly submissive. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like you watch all the sports stuff and they say, well, that, that guy just gave 110% effort. No, he did not. That's ridiculous. You can't give 110% effort. What we, we grade on a curve. So when everybody else is out there giving 80% and somebody gives 95%, that looks like, well, gosh, that's over the, that's over the top. That's No. The Lord has told us that we are loved Him with all. With all. That means with everything you have. You can't be overly submitted to God. You can't be overly in love with God. You can't be overly committed to serving God. There's never too much. There's never too much. All right? It said we're supposed to be totally complying with all he has commanded. You can't be overly compliant. And that is hardly spiritless. My goodness, you can't do that without being filled with the Spirit. And I use that word again. Words are important. Filled with the Spirit. Filled means it's total, it's complete. You know, if, if you go into a place and ask them to give you a full glass of soda and they come out and it's got, you know, that much left to the top, that's not full. They may call it full today, but the fact of the matter is what full means is to the brim. So there's no room for any more, right? That's supposed to be, we are supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Word of God says in so many places. But here's what I, this is really, really important, because when we start talking about blessed than the meek, the world has taught you that that means weak. Yes, that's true. Absolutely. The meek person, that's the weak. The, the, right. Let me just say this, and this is, this is the truth. Meek and weak are not related terms. Meek is not the opposite of weak. Meekness has nothing to do with strength. It has to do with humility. All right. Now, I would like to say that it takes strength to be meek. That's what I wanted to say, but it's not quite true, actually. It's a paradox. What it takes to be meek. Here's what it takes to be meek. Obedience and a dying to self. We have come to glorify strength. It's that's how we tell somebody who's a hero. He's strong. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with being strong. But that's not a characteristic that God says any place that He's looking for, other than we're to be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might, not our own. Listen to this verse. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak, the weak things of this world, to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. Listen to this. So that no man may boast before God. It's about humility. So that you can't boast before God. And, you know, boasting before God, that's the opposite of humility. It's pride. Right? Look what I that's first that's first Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty six through twenty nine I read. The followers of Jesus Christ are supposed to be now you gotta excuse my mixed metaphors here, right? Little lambs who are gentle and innocent as doves, that's what the Gospel of Matthew Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, and courageous as lions. That's what it says in Proverbs. Right? That's a contradiction in terms. But it's not an oxymoron. Because, in fact, it's not a contradiction. It's just contrary to opinion. You have the power, the Spirit of God within you gives you the power to be humble and gentle as lambs and still be as courageous and as bold as lions. That's what the Word of God says. That's what it says in Proverbs 28. It says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. And this is why you have to come to the place where you understand this concept, that scriptures are paradoxical, that there is this paradox, that what the world has been teaching you, what the world teaches everybody can get, a, get its claws on, is that the Word of God is wrong. So when you come upon the Word of God and the, the truth of the Word, it doesn't seem right to you, because it doesn't line up with what the world's wisdom is and what the world's understanding is. And it and it's in the world when they do movies and whenever they Anything. portray yeah. ministers or anybody that is of the of religion, so so to speak, that's because that's what they understand. They're always wishy washy when Absolutely. Oh I, you, spineless. Stupid or they're guilty yeah. of the murder. Well but the but the fact of the matter is if you want to see an example is, is the Apostle Paul. And remember, the Apostle Paul said, imitate me, be an imitator of me, even as I am of Christ, right? He also wrote in the second letter to the Corinthians this. It was talking about that thorn in the flesh that he had. And if you don't know what that is, you, that's your study for the week. Go find out what that thorn in the flesh is. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with my weaknesses, with insults and distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When you've died to yourself, you find life in Christ Jesus. These are paradoxes. They are contrary to what the world teaches, but they are the truth. And we have to learn to take thoughts captive. We need to learn to set aside what our brain wants to tell us, because our brain has been conditioned with these lies from the time you were born until the time you were saved and came to know Jesus Christ who is the truth. You've got to set those things aside and choose the Word of God. It's not that you... This is why Paul, listen, says, don't be conformed to this world, Romans 12, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you don't do this, if you don't understand that what you naturally think is contrary to the Word of God, and the Word of God, which is contrary to the world, is the truth, and start acting on the truth rather than on that lie, you are not going to be transformed. You will be a Christian walking around looking just like the rest of the world. This is ever so important. Yes, I mean, because the Sermon on the Mount, as we get into this, this is the epitome of paradox. You know, to love your enemy, to turn the other cheek, to don't worry about anything in the world when the world is filled with worry and anxiety. 
If you don't understand this concept of paradox, if you don't understand that what we have to come to trust in is something that is opposite of the teaching, of the understanding, of the wisdom of the world, you're going to have such a struggle in your Christian walk. And that's a battle of the flesh. And Paul said that that's a constant battle. It's a constant conflict between the spirit and the flesh. Because you were well indoctrinated. No matter, you know, if you got saved at five years old, I'm going to tell you something. The devil got you and did a lot to you in five years. You know, I was 33 years old. I was, it was on my 33rd birthday that I got saved. But you surrendered. I, I did, but I began to recognize that I had, I had to, if I was going to lead the life that Christ was calling me to, I had to choose to stop and think in every situation and think about what the Word said rather than what popped into my brain. And that's where the idea of this purple grass came from. It's really cool. you got to go look at that. Bible uh, As a matter of fact, when we put this up later on, I'll, I'll put the address for the Bible, by that particular Bible. Line. One of the things that just struck me was you were talking about the definition of meek, uh, being spineless. Uh, first popped into my mind, in him we move... Have our being? Yeah. yeah. And it... You know, he is our spine. He is our backbone. We are supposed to be totally obedient to him. And the world sees that as being a puppet or spineless or stupid right. or brainwashed. Yes, but the problem is most of the church has fallen into agreement with that because they, don't, they, they are not transformed. So they're saying the same thing. Listen, we have been conditioned and trained by the world to be aggressive. To be aggressive yes. and to pursue the things that we want and to stand up and be men. Taught that real men are strong and tough. And all too often, the church is teaching the opposite thing. I mean, I've heard, I've gone to churches and they say, we're not going to take this anymore, we're going to stand up, we're going to go take this, we're going to go... Well, well That's they it. have all their picketing and their marches. But you want to know something? That's not meekness. No. And you don't get blessed and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The only thing that works, and when I say work, I'm talking about the only thing that will bring the fullness of joy, peace, and love, and the, the, the gifts, the fruit of the Holy Spirit into your life, is following what Jesus is teaching. Listen, these I, the Beatitudes, what it is, it's not about being happy. It is about the behavior and attitudes, behavior, attitudes, that Christ says, here is the fullness of life. If you want to walk in the victory that Paul experienced all through his life, if you want to understand the fullness of God, here are the behaviors and attitudes that you have to have. That's what the Beatitudes are. And then, basically, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is kind of a commentary on the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. All right? But here, they're contrary. I mean, blessed are those who mourn. We don't want to mourn. We want to go out and party. You know, blessed... Well... <laughs> we're going to get to those later. Yeah, we're getting but we, we're conditioned, I mean, you've got to be a tough guy, right? I, think, of, think about this. I don't know if you know who Arnold Stang is. You know, nobody's going to old enough no, to remember that. Okay, know. you're not even old enough to remember that. I know who okay. Arnold Stang is. Uh, Don Knotts, remember Don Knotts? Yes. Well, think about all the, the characters that Don Knotts played. Right. Now think about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Right? Who would you have, rather have in your corner if it comes to a fight? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes. <laughs> Because we know that those are the guys that walk in victory. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Stallones. That, but that's what we have been conditioned to do, and that's what we're doing in the church. Who is the strongest man that ever lived? Samson. Now, if you ever watch what the world, because the world can't get this, if you ever watch the way the world portrays Samson, yeah. it's got to be a Schwarzenegger. Exactly. It's got to be this muscle builder. But the fact of the matter is, if it was a Schwarzenegger, nobody would have questioned, where does this strength come from? But if it was were, a Don Knotts. If it was a Don Knotts. <laughs> because people were astounded at the strength of Samson because they couldn't see any earthly reason for it. There was no physical outward appearance. Peter. The Apostle Peter. I'm going to tell you something. And I say this with absolute certitude in my life. Peter was a tough guy. Fisherman. Peter was a tough guy. I'm telling you the truth. Now, well, I don't know him. 
I mean, so how do I know that? I know fishermen. Yeah. I know I know sailors. These are guys that go out and do hard, hard physical labor Sinus. who are working with these heavy nets and bringing in catches that can almost sink a boat. I mean, these are guys... These are not little, you know, guys sitting in a, in behind, nothing wrong with sitting behind a desk. But they're not sitting behind a desk, you know, pushing a pencil. These are guys that are out there. Facing the and weather, it, the storm. Yes. Uh, and if you ever knew tough people, if you ever knew sailors, if you ever knew, I'm, you know, fishermen, commercial fishermen. I'm not talking about the guy who goes out fly fishing as a hobby. What's that show about right. commercial fishermen? Right. Deadliest Catch. Yeah. yeah. Deadliest Catch. That's, that's, that's You go watch that once or twice. That's Peter that's and his brother that's Andrew. Not, that's James and John. These were tough guys. Mm -hmm. And yet, they found, and it took a while, they found the power to be meek. But it didn't come easy, right? Peter heard the sermon. Peter was there. Yes, he was. He was, you know, it's great to talk about this. It's great to read it. It's great to study it. But was Peter there. was there. When he heard Jesus, and by the way, Jesus is not speaking to the multitudes. Jesus is there gathering. He is looking in Peter's eyes, and he says these things. Blessed are the meek. Okay. Peter heard Jesus say this. Now, I just say this. It is ever so important to understand that Peter heard Jesus say this to him. Which is not the same as hearing Jesus say it to the crowd. Yes. And if you don't understand the importance of hearing Jesus speak to you, you will never have your life changed by the Word of God. I, I preached a sermon in, in England not long ago. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say, and, and I say this not boastfully, I say it because it was a factually... It changed a lot of lives over there. But one of the lives that changed was mine. Because what, and, and just to briefly kind of encapsulate that, it was in the account of the event of Jesus and Lazarus. When Jesus went to the tomb, and I'm sure you all know the story of Lazarus, John chapter 11, go check it. And Jesus stood before this tomb that the stone had been rolled away, and he cried out with a loud voice, it says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, of course, did, right? But the thing is, I've heard so many people, I've heard so many teachers, I've heard so many pastors say, well, you know, if he hadn't said Lazarus, if he just said come forth, everybody would have come forth. Well, well, they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. If Jesus had not said Lazarus, come forth, nobody would have come forth. Because until you hear him speak to you, nothing happens. And he does speak to us. He knows us. He knows us by name. He called us by name. And he called us out of that tomb, out of darkness, out of death, into life by calling you by name. You need to hear Jesus. That's why it's, listen, it is not so important you hear what I have to say. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is to meditate on this word until you hear Jesus speak to you. Peter heard Jesus speak to him. So that could change his life. However, Peter being Peter, on the night that Jesus was taken, he goes into a garden. And in the garden, he's there. And of course, the Roman soldiers, the Sanhedrin's soldiers, the Pharisees come to take Jesus, to put him on trial, to kill him. And that was their intention, was to come to kill him. Peter was there, and when when he's approached, Peter's reaction is, he pulls... Now, think about this. You couldn't be confronted with more power, personally, than they were that night in the garden. The Roman soldiers. These are guys who conquered the world. The soldiers of the, of the, of the Sanhedrin. I mean, these are the people. They've got all the authority. They've got all the power. But Peter reaches out, takes his sword, strikes one of the men, and cuts his ear off. I'm telling you, he was a tough guy. Yes. And his initial reaction is to respond with what he has been preconditioned to do. Use his own strength to deal with the situation. And Jesus stops him. 
and says, put the sword up. He who lives by the sword, dies by the sword. And he healed the man that, G that Peter had struck. Peter was ready to defend Jesus Christ. The same Peter who heard Jesus in the Sermon on the Sabbath say, love your enemies. If your enemy strikes you, turn and let him strike you again. If he demands that you unfairly, unjustly are to go a mile with him, what Roman soldiers had the power to do, he said, you go too. If they take your coat, I mean, you're sure, give me your coat too. Peter heard this, but it hadn't happened in his heart yet because it's still purple grass and he still reacts with his flesh nature, his nature, natural person, right? So Peter is defending Jesus Christ. I am sickened by how many times in the last 35 years that I've been doing this, I have heard Christians who want to go out and defend Christianity as they understand it. Let's, and this is one of the reasons that Christians should not, cannot be involved in worldly affairs and politics. Because it may be the right reaction for the world to go out and deal with enemies. It is not the Christian response and reaction to enemies that Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. But what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount is absolutely contrary to the world's understanding and wisdom about these situations. If you are, if you would take up arms to defend Christianity, there's no Christianity left to defend. I don't know what it is you're defending, but it's not. Je it is not the teaching of Jesus Christ. So when, when uh, one of the most famous religious Christian spirit-filled teachers in the United States says, "Well, you ought to go out and kill the leader of another country because he doesn't like his politics." He hasn't heard, he hasn't heard those words of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount ring in his heart yet. They have not connected from his heart to his natural brain. And that's why we have to train ourselves to take thoughts captive. I can understand the feeling that rises up. But you know what? We're not really guided by our feelings, but by the Word of God. Okay. You can be meek. You can be humble. You don't need to defend yourself. You don't need your own strength. And here's why. Oh, I love this. Well, this is another good song. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? We've got to get a choir in here for these Bible studies. Yeah. That's two good songs tonight. He's my defense. I'm not his defense. Jesus Christ, listen, what were the Crusades about for hundreds of years? Come on. There's another song, Defend Me, O Lord. Yeah, well, we sing the words. Yes. We go out and we have church and we talk about these and we preach sermons. I don't care about the sermons. I don't care about the songs. I care about the life that we lead that is visible to the world. That the world can see the presence of Christ Jesus because that that is your ministry. I don't care. It's not. No, it doesn't say this is not part of the fivefold ministry. It's not because you went to the seminary. It's not because you've been ordained. But you, you, my brother, you, my sister, have a ministry. And that ministry is this. To bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. And you acting opposite of what Jesus Christ is, what Jesus Christ taught, what Jesus Christ lived, does not bring his presence, I promise you that. If you lift up arms to defend Christianity, there's no Christianity left to defend. Okay, so though none of the dictionaries that I looked at say this, but the word teaches it. The opposite of being meek is not strength, not right. The opposite of meek is not weak, not a lack of strength, or the opposite is not strength rather. The opposite of meek is this. Write this down. Pride. That's what the opposite of meek is, because when we refuse to have that meekness in our life, it's because it's not because we what we how we think people think about Jesus. It's about how we think people think about 
us. We are afraid to be seen as weak. Because that's not the heroic view that has been pitched by Hollywood. We are afraid to be seen as gentle when real men are strong and tough. It is the pride, the pride of life that causes us, in reality, to hate meekness and to put it down, to make it an object of derision, to make it a comedy act. That's why Don Knotts did so well in the movies, why Arnold sang, well, you don't remember because you're too young. Because these are the guys there, I, 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 milk toasts, was oh. it was an old, old time expression. Yeah. They're meek. They're, but you want to know something? They're not meek according to the word of God. They're, they're weak according to the world. Right? A study not very long ago, just recently at UCLA, University of California in Los Angeles, did a study, a major study, and it showed they spent a lot of money on this, right? Um, that men actually overcome their fears and show off primarily for the benefit of females. Mm. Ah, don't spend money on surveys like that, studies like that. Send me a check. I'll tell you in two seconds. It's like, hey, men, guys are peacocks. Oh, a woman going, no, out come the old plumes. <laughs> Baby, let me show you what I got. I mean, you know, this is, this is human nature, but it's fallen human nature, right? Pride is about self-esteem. Pride is a highly cultivated goal today, both inside and outside the church. We need to die to ourselves. Pride is the absolute enemy of God inside the, inside the believer. Pride is a horrible, hateful thing. It's insidious. It'll, you know, I, uh, this is not a joke. I'm saying this in all honesty. I can remember, because uh, without sharing my whole testimony by any means, before I got saved, I was a prideful person. Now, let me just tell you this. Everybody who's not saved is filled with pride. That's the truth. Regardless of, what, regardless of outward appearance, they're, they're filled with pride. Because that is part of fallen human nature. The Word of God calls it the pride of life. Right? I got saved sitting at my kitchen table on my birthday, my 33rd birthday. And what, what the Lord dealt with in my life was that pride right off the bat. And it was because I lacked understanding of a lot of things. Probably still do, but that's, uh, praise God. He's been transforming me, bringing me from glory to glory. I may not look as glorious to you, but I look glorious to him, but I've still got a long way to go. I thought more highly of myself than I should. We all do. Until I encountered the risen Jesus Christ, the King of glory. And then I realized just how significant I was, just how important I was. Just how much the world needed me. Not at all. And it was that revelation of Jesus Christ, to understand what glory truly is, that made me nothing. And when I got to the place where I was absolutely nothing, He lifted me up. That's what the Word of God says. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will exalt you. He'll lift you up. So Christ lifted me up into new life. And that pride, I'm telling you, God dealt with it, pow, like that in my life. I was conscious of pride, and I was more conscious of it because I had this experience. So I really became conscious of how God had, was dealing with, had dealt with the pride in my life. And I became, a, for the first time in my life, I became a humble person. And I became proud of my humility. Now that's an oxymoron. <laughs> and it just it struck me how insidious this is. What an incredible problem this is to deal with in our lives. Because we want to be recognized. We want to be liked. We want to be loved. But we look for it. In all, you know, there wasn't an old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. If you, if you are satisfied, and we're going to get to this, 
pretty soon in our study. Being satisfied. If you're satisfied with the love of God, which is the most incredible love that the world has ever known, you don't need other people's love. That's not, that doesn't mean it's bad to have. But you don't have to go out and seek it, and you don't have to pretend to be something you're not in order to try and get it. And what the Word of God says is that we're supposed to seek and show ourselves approved unto God. He's the one that we want the approval from. He's the one that we want esteem from. America is infatuated with self-esteem. Self-esteem will kill you. But God esteems you. God the Father esteems you so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world in the fullness of time to die in your place. That's how much God esteems you. If you understand that, self-esteem will never be another issue. But obviously, most of us don't understand that, and we struggle with it. All right? It's about pride. Now, I said this, you know, I, I mentioned guys. Guys want to be... Uh, I said that because I'm a guy. I mean, that's my perspective. I understand that much better. Macho man. Yeah, I am. And uh, it says as righteous or as bold as a lion. So the question is, will I be brave enough, will I be bold enough to talk about women folk? <laughs> Maybe we ought to switch okay. places and have her do that. Remember, if, you, if this upsets you, you can write to me at ralph at something.com. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Okay. In America, tens of billions of dollars are spent each year for jewelry. Okay. To make people feel better about themselves more attractive, okay? Now, I, listen, I'm not sitting here tonight to say I hate jewelry, although I don't have a love affair with it. And if you understand the horror of what it takes to produce some of it, maybe it would change your mind. Uh, great great movie was that one with Leonardo Blood DiCaprio. Blood Diamond. Blood Diamond. Go look, that's the reality. I mean, Alice and I and Mark, we've been to Africa. I'm going to tell you, that's the reality of this around the world. Billions of dollars. The eight billion dollars that are spent each year in the U.S. on cosmetics is coincidentally roughly the same amount that it would take to provide clean water and sanitation to all, all the people in the developing nations around the world today. Wow. That's, that's one shot. Eight billion dollars yes. would do the whole deal. Right. And we spend that per year. Yeah, yes. okay. Women spend Women, well. Well, uh, there are probably yes, some guys that would use cosmetics, cosmetics with uh, not may, cosmetics. may God deal with them, right? You know. But I, and listen, I'm not saying. I, please examine. You, you, I don't know how you can examine my heart. You shouldn't take offense at this. Well, you shouldn't take offense at anything. No. But but bear in mind as we draw near the end of time that the sin of Sodom and, and Gomorrah, the sin of Sodom was not homosexuality. That was a symptom. That was a symptom. It wasn't, it wasn't the reason. The reason was, it says in Ezekiel chapter 16, that they were at ease and didn't care about others. America spent so much on things to make us feel better about ourselves, look better to others. It's all about pride. Pride is the root of this. It is the root of it. Listen, if you're a child of God, we need to face reality. We need to have the courage, the righteous or as bold as a lion, we need to have the courage to look at what's going on in our lives and say, let a man examine himself and examine our lives and say, is, is this the way the Lord wants me to live my life? I, I, I'm, I'm going to say that. The weekly fashion show that takes place at many, many churches mm. need, every Sunday mm. needs to be examined. Oh my goodness, yes. Because that's what it is. Yes, it is. It's a right. weekly fashion show. Mm. They need to be self-examined. I'm not going to examine your behavior. That's not for me. That's not. But you need to be self-examining. Mm. Are the fancy and expensive and very often otherwise unused garments worn to these Sunday services 
Do you wear them to please God? Do they make a person more holy? We need to look at this realistically because the church is filled with Pharisees because we have been trained the, in, instead of the church changing the world we've allowed the world to change the church and this is what the church is teaching in its behavior and actions all right do they make a person more holy i mean i go to holiness churches and they're all okay i'm not going to go there but the questions i'm asking by the way are rhetorical questions they don't need any answer because the answer is all too obvious if you read the word of god it's pretty obvious what the answers are so let me just say this about being me james said Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Peter said, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. God's purpose in calling you to humble yourself is not to put you down. God's purpose is to lift you up. God's purpose is to bless you. That's what we're talking about here in the Beatitudes. His desire, his great desire, his purpose is to bless you. This is the instruction on how you get the blessings. Examine yourself. Study these things. Who does God choose to use? We need to look at this realistically. I read in the newspaper, or well, not the newspaper, but online, uh, that Spielberg is going to do another Moses and the Ten Commandments movie, the, like Charlton Heston. I, really? Yeah, I just, I just read that. And I thought about, you know, the portrayal of Hollywood's portrayal of these people is so wrong. It's so wrong. Moses. Numbers 12.3 says this, Now the man, Moses, was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. This is who God chose. Stammering didn't matter. The fear that he had going up in there, none of that mattered. What mattered was his humility, his meekness. John the Baptist Jesus Christ said of John the Baptist, nobody had a greater ministry than John the Baptist. Here's what John the Baptist said. John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. John the Baptist said, talking about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. God chooses the humble, the meek, that his power be perfected in the world, that his power, remember that verse we started with tonight? He chooses the, the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. He chooses the weak to shame the strong. That's where is that teaching Jesus. in the church? But that's where you will see Jesus. That's where you will see meekness and majesty. That's right. Meekness and majesty. Oh, no, no. Okay, God. This is like Paul did. Paul said, for I know. This is, I, there are few people that have ever walked the face of the earth have been used by the Lord God to make a difference in the world like the Apostle Paul. Here's what Paul said. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Wretched man that I am. And he called himself the foremost, the chiefest of sinners. He didn't have people carrying him around on, on, on their shoulders. He didn't elevate himself. He refused it. Whenever Peter, when he went into the house of Cornelius and Cornelius fell down, Peter said, you get up, I'm a man just like you. These are men of God that God chose to use who would not take any of the glory for themselves, who were not looking for the esteem of men, but they were looking for the approval of God. They were meek and they were blessed. I, I was going to talk about Joe the Sweeper, but I'll get to that someday because I don't have time this evening. I want you to listen to this verse. This is 1 Peter 3, 4. Now, this is Peter after the day of Acts. After he has been filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, he is a different Peter than the Peter early on. Because now he has the power to live what he heard Jesus speak. And you need that power of the Holy Spirit to live the words that you will hear Jesus speak. 
But here's what he said. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. A gentle and quiet spirit is precious in the sight of God. This is from the tough guy, the fisherman, the man with a sword ready to use it, a gentle and quiet spirit. Learn from Peter. It's the word of God. So it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. This is a reference to gaining the promised land. All right? A lot of people debate, well, does that mean that they're going to be in charge of the earth here? Now, let me just tell you something. Jesus Christ, and it's important, and this is a good place for me to say this, it's important for you to know that Jesus Christ is not teaching anything new in the Sermon on the Mount. He is giving new understanding to what God has already spoken. All right? Jesus lets, remember he said in John chapter 12, he didn't speak anything unless he heard it from the Father. We started this study in the Sermon on the Mount talking about how Jesus prayed for a night before he gave the sermon, hearing from the Father what he should speak. Jesus is the Word of God, who he is, but the scriptures flowed from Jesus. All right? The secret of the, secret of the Lord, I talked about getting understanding from the Lord, is for those who fear him. And he will make them know his covenant. That's 20, Psalms 25, 14. This is revelation, right? Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. He will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. Psalm 25, verse 12 and 13. In Psalm 37, and by the way, there's a lot of these verses. I'm just picking a couple to show you this. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Abraham and his descendants, according to Genesis 15, right? And in Romans 4, Paul talks about, because God had promised Abraham and his descendants that they would inherit the land, right? For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Amram, Abraham, who is the father of us all. In other words, what I'm doing, I'm showing scripture after scripture, where God's promise was that, that these people would inherit the land. Jesus is referring back to these scriptures. So where is the promised land? Where is the promised land? Where is this land? By the way, in Hebrew it's called Haaretz. That's the land. Israel, all right? But there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, all right? There's going to be a new Jerusalem. John saw it. John the Revelator saw it coming down from heaven, all right? Uh, this, this verse I want you to listen to very carefully because this is how it ends. This is from Revel the last chapter of the Bible. Revelations chapter 22, verses 12 to 14. I'm reading from the King James. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. You want to know where the land is that we're going to inherit if we are meek? Well, we got to go... It says, well, I get the tree of life in the city. It's back to the garden in the city of our great God. It is the Canaan land. It is the land flowing with milk and honey. It is back in the garden in the presence of God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ. That's where the land is that we will inherit if we choose to be humble and meek in the sight of the Lord. So, Father, that's my prayer this week, is by the power of your Spirit working within us, we would have that power and ability to surrender ourselves, to die to ourselves, not to seek our own, but, Lord, to surrender and just give all the honor, all the glory to you. 
Lord, that we would have that heart of humility that you desire in our lives. It's precious to you. And Lord, that you and you alone would be exalted in our lives. Lord, use us for the glory of your name. God bless you. And until next time.